My sophomore year was technically my bad year. That's when I kind of got involved with the wrong people, kind of got involved with those guys who, yo, drinking's cool, have a sip of this, or here, smoking's cool, have a toe to this, and just stuff like that. By being friends with them, I was friends with so many more people. And like, I guess that was the cool thing to be. And in school, it's, you always want to be cool. You always want to be some of that, part of that popular crowd. And I don't even think some of my friends growing up knew I was even a Christian. Because I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't talk about it. I mean, I didn't say I wasn't a Christian, but then again, I didn't say I was. I was involved in church, but I wasn't involved in it. I came to church to keep up, to keep appearance. I didn't pretend to be anybody I'm not, but I didn't like try to hide myself either. I mean, I didn't go around bragging, dude, I partied this weekend, I got so wasted, I don't even know like what day it is today. No, I didn't do that, but I came to church and I would just pretend like nothing happened. Gosh, I think it was my freshman year is the first time that I, uh, I I started getting involved in shoplifting and stuff like that. And I did it again with that crowd that does the drugs and stuff like that. And then um, last year, I was working at a store in the mall and I had gotten there early and because uh, I read the schedule wrong or something like that. And so one of my friends met me up there and we were just walking around. And I, I knew I knew deep down because I hadn't stolen since the incident my freshman year. I knew deep down that I should walk away right there, but I kept up with it anyways, just because this was a chick I liked. She was, she was hot, I, I wanted to be with her, and so I was gonna do what it took so I could be with her. She started shoplifting stuff, and she grabbed a watch, and she says, here's your Christmas present. And she grabbed a watch, and she put it in her purse, and the guy comes running up to me, and I have this fear-struck look on my face. And the guy goes, we need our merchandise back. And she goes, what, his watch? Immediately drug me under right there, threw me under the bus. And I realized then that I wanted to be with that and she just completely ratted me out. And we go to jail. Uh, and that was one of the most frightening experiences of my life. And uh, I called my mom and uh, I was like, hey mom, what are you doing? And I just kind of stopped and she goes, what's wrong? I was like, mom, I'm in jail. And I just hear the phone drop and I hear my mom immediately start crying in the middle of the store and my heart just sank. To hear her crying and sobbing like that at the fact that I had messed up and hung out with the wrong people just broke my heart. First of all, it's, it's pretty easy to lie. Um, I mean, Rodney got caught, but you know, for the most part, we, we all have lied and gotten away with it. And some of us have gotten pretty good at it, and we can fool people, we can fool our parents, we can fool... My, my brother, he actually bought a car and didn't tell my mom about it. He parked it around the corner. I mean, it, it's, it's easy to lie. You, you can get away with just about anything, but at the end of the day, if you're a Christian, you realize God sees everything. Um, there, there's that passage in uh, Revelation 3 there's this church in Sardis, and Jesus says to them, he goes, I know your works. He says, you have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. So he says, you've got this reputation like, oh, you're so alive, you're so on fire for me. He goes, but I know the truth about you, you're dead. And yet he says about the church, he, he, later on in verse four, he says, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels." And I love that though, because he says, okay, so for the most part, you guys have this reputation that you're so alive, but I know the truth about you. He goes, but there's a few individuals in that city. There are a few of them that they're gonna be fine. They're gonna be absolutely fine. And we gotta remember that. It's, it's like, you can have a reputation of being so in love with Jesus and, and live a totally double life. I mean, take this to its logical conclusion. You spend your life lying, pretending you're something you're not. Meanwhile, Psalm 139, in Psalm 139, God says, I've searched you and I know you. I, I know everything about you. And so while other people have searched you out and they, didn't, they never found the truth, God does know the truth about you and you stand before him one day and, and you spend your whole life fooling everyone. Th you know, everyone thinks you're this great Christian, but then when you face God, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. And so you end up in hell 
You're not exactly rejoicing down there going, oh, but I fooled everyone in, on earth. They think I'm in heaven. No, that's not the way you want to end it. You, you want to just be honest with everything. God says he'll forgive you. Jesus says he'll forgive you. And, and, and you want to be one of those like I, I read in Revelation 3, where, where Jesus says that he'll confess you before the Father. I mean, just have Jesus one day say, oh, this, is, this is Rodney. He was the real thing. Uh, Father, let him in. I, I can't wait for that day that, to have Jesus say, this is Francis, yeah, he made his mistakes, but he was honest about those. He was the real thing. Um, I'll confess him before you. Let's let him into the kingdom. My life growing up, it wasn't particularly the best lifestyle. Uh, my church life when I was young, I, I did go to church and then I stopped going for a whole, for a while. And then my stepfather reintroduced me to the church and he, he showed me how, how God can take you from certain things and build you up greater. Like me, I didn't have really much growing up. I didn't have no toys. And I would see other people at school with a phone or an MP3 player or, or something, some kind of game playing on it at recess or something. And I wanted all that, but I couldn't have it. I say the first time I ever stole something, I think when I was like two days after I turned eight years old, I was going down the street one day and I happened to see a go-kart that was just sitting there. And I got in it and I took it. And the whole time I was driving it, and I was laughing about it, but then at the same time I was thinking about it, I was like, I shouldn't even have did them like that. But you know, there's always that part that your conscience, the part of your conscience that tells you, you know, go ahead and keep doing it, keep doing it. There ain't nothing wrong with it. So I always followed that part of my conscience and I think that's what's got me in a lot of the trouble that, I, that I've gotten in so far. I figured I, I, I pretty much knew the way how not to get caught. So I was just doing it. It was pretty much on a nightly basis. I, I was I always had something brand new, like a game system or a DVD player or, you know, something so I could sell. And, but my breaking point was when my mom told me that, that she heard about the stuff that I was doing and how every night she was crying and, and she was telling me that my grandfather was praying for me and that there was people that I didn't even know but that knew about me and they were praying for me. Kind of made me realize you know, that, man, maybe there is people, you know what I'm saying, that, that love me and care for me even though I don't know them. There's repercussions and choices on every corner you hit. I'm struggling to pay my bills and make this much rent. For every evil word I spoke has been the consequence. That's why I'm searching for this man named Jesus Christ who be heaven. So it really, he really matured my heart, my mind, you know, I, I don't I don't really want to go back to lifestyle no more, which I did, but the more I pray to him, I pray for patience, you know, that, that he's shown me just so that way I could be, grow up and be successful like I know he wants me to be. At the core of being a Christian, it means we're becoming like Christ. Um, First John 2.6 says, whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So I should resemble Jesus in the way I act, the way I talk, and, and Jesus never fit in. I mean, he never fit in. He, he didn't conform to what everyone else did. He set the standard. He says, look, it doesn't matter that everyone says this. He goes, he says this over and over. I know you've been told this, but that's not the truth. Here's the truth. Let me lay it out for you. And he lived differently. and. And this whole idea, though, of obeying the command, it, it's got to come from this desire to be like Christ. And, and not only that, but maybe more importantly, a desire to love Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. Okay, so at the core of this, it's got to be about a love relationship with Jesus. And Jesus, when you're in love with me, you will obey. It's like my wife one time, she, uh, she asked me, she goes, she goes, honey, is there, is there anything I do that bugs you? And I thought, yeah, <laughs> you know, here's a couple of things. And, and I told her, and her whole point in asking was, she wanted to just stop doing anything that bugged me. Uh, because after I told her those things, she totally stopped. And, and 
I, I thought, well, that's so cool. Like, she loves me so much, and she just wants to know, is there anything I do that, that bugs you? Because because I, I want to make you happy. And that's love right there. And so then I asked her, like, okay, well, what are some of the things I do that bugs you? And she had a list, you know, but, but it, was, it was one of those things where I realized, man, that's a lot about love, is I care about this person so much, I don't want to... I don't want to make them miserable, and and the thought that my sin could grieve the Holy Spirit of God, um, as Ephesians talks about, that kind of blows my mind. I don't want to do that. I love him. That's why I don't want to sin. And so the question at the end of the day is not, oh man, did I, did I blow away? Did I break this command? No, it's like, am I really showing that I love Jesus by the way that I, I live? Because he says, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. I started going to a private Christian school when I was probably six and was at that same school with the same people through all the way through eighth grade. And so when it came time for me to be in ninth grade and start high school, my parents just decided that I should go to this public school. I had already made up my mind before even stepping foot in the door that it wasn't something I was going to enjoy. I was shocked by how blatantly against religion some people seemed to be. It was out of my comfort zone to meet people who, whose beliefs were so drastically different. I finally convinced my parents, you know, I just, I really want to look at a private school just because, you know, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. And so they finally agreed and it was really hard for me to discern, God, do you want me to leave public school because that's what you want for me? Are you leading me that direction or is that is that my flesh? I said over and over again, you know, I just loved this private school. I felt so comfortable. I kind of was like, okay, well, I could be comfortable or I could save a life. You know, after that, I was like, you know what? I, I'm gonna stay at Highland Park. Like, I don't know why I was so caught up in myself that whole freshman year was just all about me. And sophomore year when I went into school, the blinders on my eyes were just opened a little bit wider. I got put into a chemistry class with this girl named Leah. She, she didn't run in the same friend group I did, and I could tell that she just didn't fit with the people she was hanging out with. Through like that chemistry class we were in together, you know, and having seen her multiple times a week, we kind of started to develop a relationship. And I invited her to come on my church's ski trip. On that trip, her life completely changed. I think that she really surrendered it to Christ and decided that she wanted something more than what she had been living. The transformation from you know, the fall of junior year to the spring of junior year in her life is, is black and white. I just feel like Leah was that life that you know, I'd said you know, I could go to a private school and be comfortable or I could save a life. And that life is now one of my best friends and is somebody who's impacted way more people than I ever could. If I had done what I wanted to and gone to a private school where I would have been comfortable and happy, I would have missed out on some unbelievable opportunities with relationships and ministry. I realized that I found myself being really passive in my faith. No one was calling me to a higher standard. It's been so much fun to meet the friends that I have and get to have Leah as one of my best friends. None of that would have happened if I had gone to a private school. I love that story about Anna because everyone in high school has got this one mindset for the most part. It's like, let me just, let me just go do my thing. Let me make friends. Let me have fun. Let me just do what feels good. And, and here she is on her campus going, no, I'm put here to make disciples. Like, like she goes, I, I'm not here just to enjoy these years. I'm thinking about my friends. I, I love my friends. I love these people that if they were to die today, they'd, they'd end and not spend eternity in heaven, and it breaks her heart. And, and I love that because that's not the typical mindset, but that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. He, he, he calls us out, like he, he found these fishermen. He goes, hey, for, forget about your fish for a second. I'm calling you to something different. I'm making you fishers of men. And, and when you look at your, your campus as a mission field, as this is what I'm created to do, I'm just to go and make disciples, that's gonna be so different than everyone else there. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. 
because you're not conforming to what everyone else is thinking, but you're actually loving people. And, and it's not something where you have to feel like, okay, God told me to speak to this person. He may do that at some point, but more is just something you, you do whenever you see there's a need. Um, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, what would you want someone to do for you if you didn't know Jesus? And, and, and when the, someone asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? He tells the story of that good Samaritan where, where a, a guy's walking along, he just sees someone beat up on the side of the road. It's, it's whoever you run into. And so as you walk, pe you know, walk by people on your way to class, that's your neighbor right there. Love them, say what you need to say to them, act as though that were you. What would you want someone to say to you? Wouldn't you want them to be bold enough, you know, like Anna was, and to, to care for you and to lay out uh, the truth? Because, think about it, you could be used by God to help one of your friends <laughs> walk away from hell and enter heaven forever. What else do you want to do during your time in high school?